Anything in your minds? No? Okay. Uh, today we're starting a new topic, um, finding stuff, which you might all remember from your playground days as finders keepers. Um, but the topic is a little bit more confusing as we will see. So let's start off with a question. Uh, let me put the link to the class notes um, in the chat so you have them. We have a lot of questions. I think like eight or nine questions. So question number one for you all. Here's your question. Armory versus Delamory applied which of the following doctrines? Acquisition by discovery. Acquisition by capture. Acquisition by find or all the above. All right. Um, who is next up on the list? I believe it's me. All right, Luis. Thank Luis. you so much. Yeah. Thank you, sir. All right, Luis. Let me stop the poll. I think we got just about everyone. What did you put here, sir? Uh, I answered C. Okay. Why'd you put C? Uh, well, the first reason is because this case is in the acquisition by find section. <laughs> so it's in the and chapter, so that's all it is. <laughs> it's a good, right. that's, that's I good. Mean, I thought about putting all the above just because it was like interesting, you know, like it could have been. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I put C. All right. Well, Luis, let me ask you a question. Why is this not an exercise of capture? He took the jewel. Well, because the way he captured it, so he found the jewel. So, I mean, what? I guess you could still consider it being capture. Hmm. Okay. All right. So that's Luis. Uh, next up is uh, uh, Lance here. I think you're in the classroom, if, if memory serves. See, I'm remembering. Uh, yep. Yeah. Okay, Lance, what's your answer here? Oh, boy, that's hard to hear. Try it again. Why did you say it was all the above? Oh, boy, it's hard to hear. Can someone else in the classroom try talking? Because that's really garbled. He just said normally all of the above is usually right. Normally all the above is usually right. Okay, then I can hear whoever just spoke, but not Lance. Maybe. Um, <laughs> yeah, you're going to have to speak up to Lance. I'm sorry. All right. Well, I, I appreciate your translator. So usually all the above is the right answer. I would I would get that out of your head for my class. Uh, I, I, would, I would remove that one because I don't think that's always true. Um, let's see. That was Lance. Uh, uh, Susan, you here? I am. All right, Susan, what did you put here? I also put C like Louise. Okay. Why is this not an exercise of rule of capture? Um, well, the other cases that have to do with capture, more so we're looking at actually physically grabbing something that was in movement. Like what, what, kind of, what kind of things were in movement? Like there's like wild animals were uh, oh. part of it. And um, we talked about like, uh, oil and gas also. Has What's that phrase we used to describe those things? Oil and gas, baseballs, whales. What do we use to describe that? This is a phrase we used. Is it the Latin phrase? Okay, what's the Latin phrase? It's, is it the natural fury thing? Yeah, very natural. Very good. Close enough. Very good. Very good. What does that mean in, in English? <laughs> it's been a really long time since I took Latin. Right. Um, I've never taken it. Is it just natural, like, animal? Wild I mean, animals, right? Yeah. Susan, what does rule of capture apply to? Does it apply to anything you find in the street? No, I, I don't think so. What does it apply uh, to? Well, again, it goes back to, like, natural gases, like water, okay. uh, things that have movement, not necessarily Good. something 
up off the ground. Okay, good. We're getting closer. She, uh, Grayson, you here? I think you're in the classroom. I'm here. Yeah. Grayson, what, what does the rule capture apply to? Um, I thought it was anything that was in motion, th things that can be stopped. What does What's that phrase? It begins with an F. Um, is it Latin? <laughs> no, it's English. English word begins with an F. I can't think of it. Alex? Is it fugitive? Fugitive. What does fugitive mean? It's on the move. On the move. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you, Alex. Very good. Right. I need you guys to understand this point very clearly. The answer here is C, but about a third of you got it wrong. Right, about a third of you got it wrong. Okay, it's not always D. Please get that out of your head. That's not, that's not that's not um, that's not going to be the answer in my class. Um, the rule of capture applies to fugitive resources, animals, whales, right, oil, water, things that are in motion. Right. I think you, you said motion. A couple of you made that point, which is right. I just wanted the F word. Right. It's fugitive. It's on the move. The rule of capture only applies to fugitive resources found in nature. All right. The acquisition by fine doctrine, the doctrine we have today, is not about things found in nature. It's about lost chattel, lost items, right? A piece of jewelry, a purse, a pocketbook of money, a ring. These are not fugitive. They're not alive. They don't move. They don't have natural liberty. Right, they don't they don't move around. Okay, so let's just run down the list. A is a discovery doctrine. You only apply the discovery doctrine to finding new land, right? Territory, right? You discover the new world. You discovered land on the moon. You discovered under the sea, right? You discover new land. That's where you apply the Johnson doctrine, right? Of discovery. Second. The rule of capture applies to fugitive resources like animals and whales and baseballs and oil and gas and water. You apply Pearson, you apply Gen, you apply Keeble to capture rules. Do not mix them up. Do not use Johnson for a case about an animal. Do not use Pearson for a case about land. Keep your rules separate. Today we have this third area, which is acquisition by find. Acquisition by fine is for lost chattel, right? Stationary items that don't move, a, 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 a piece of jewelry, a pocketbook, a purse, money, right? If I drop a purse on the floor, it's not going to run away like a fox, right? If I drop a ring in a pool of mud, it's not going to swim away like a whale. It's going to stay exactly where I left it. It's stationary. I'll tell you, about 10% of you in the exam will screw this up. It happens every year. I'm giving you fair warning I'm trying to give you ample warning. They will, I'll give you a question about a wild animal and they'll talk about armory versus delamory. I'll give you a question about finding new territory and you'll talk about Pearson v. Post. Please don't screw this up. It's, I'm, I'm giving it to you the answer, but get this right. I'm only being so mean because every year people make the same mistake and it kills me because I, I get the same warning. I'm not trying to trick you. I don't want to trick you. But if you give me the wrong case, you'll lose points. You made the wrong doctrine, you're going to lose some points. Okay? Michael, go ahead. Uh, on the exam, we're tested on some of these questions. Is it essential that we know the, the case names? Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Yes. So we, we need more than just the rule and, and you know, yes. kind of. Yep. Okay. Because you'll see in this case, um, there's like five cases with five rules. Right? There's no one rule of capture. There's rule of capture in Pearson for foxes. There's rule of capture in um, in in Gen for whales. Right? There's rules of capture for um, you know water. There's a rule of capture for um, oil. Here we're going to find there's a rule of capture if it's stuck in the dirt, if it's laying on a counter, if it's on the floor. You need to know each case for each rule. Absolutely. Right. When you're when you're actually attorneys, you need to cite cases, right? You're going to need to actually have a brief with cases. So, yes, absolutely. Cases, please. Alyssa, go ahead. Yeah. Um, 
Is it possible to, I just, I know you said the role of capture applies to fugitive resources found in nature and then the role of finding applies to lost chattels that are stationary. So what if there's a lost item that's in motion? Like, for example, and this might be a stupid question, but uh, if someone goes to a laundromat and leaves and forgets their laundry at the laundromat um, and it's in the dryer. <laughs> uh, I see what you're saying. Well, it's it's not moving on its own, right? I mean, if something else is moving it, that's different than the thing moving by itself. So I think it's still a chattel at that point. Okay. Gotcha. Right. I mean, eventually the, 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 the dryer will stop, I hope. Uh, it's like a dryer from hell and it goes on forever. Uh, I see uh, uh, Grayson, uh, then, then Lacey next. Just to that point, though, like in the Barry Bonds case, the ball wasn't moving on its own. It was, though. Right? The ball was flying. Someone hit it, though. It's true. It's true. Um, let me just pause. It's not clear to me that that case was correctly decided. I don't know that the ball was actually a fugitive resource like an animal. I think the court drew that analogy because it was the best he had. Does that, that, that make sense? Yeah. I mean, it's, um, you know, I think that there's debate about how fugitive the ball was, but I think it's a fair point. Yeah. Uh, Lacey, was your hand up? It was, but it was the same question Grayson had. About yeah. The Barry Bonds case. Yeah. Okay. Fair point. Alyssa, go ahead. Um. So on the exam, uh, if, for example, you give us a fact pattern about boxes specifically, should we only apply the case, the rule from the case, um, pattern, it, or should we apply all five of the capture rules? It's a really, it's a really good question. Um, I'm unlikely to give you actual case about foxes. That's too easy, but I might give you an animal that resembles a fox. I think what you have to say is this is more like a fox or this is more like a whale. Or this is more like a duck. I know that sounds insane, but you're going to have to try and analogize which is the most most relevant rule. This is not like torture. There's four factors, which is always there. Depending on the nature of the animal, there's going to be different rules to capture it. You know, I've asked in the past about capturing insects, right? How would you capture a, 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 a hive of bees, right? You know, you can't hold a bee. If you hold a bee, it's going to bite you. It's going to sting you, but you put it in a beehive, right? So there are different ways of, of, of enclosing it, right? So the, the, you have to kind of figure out what capture would be for that particular type of animal, right? There's some cases that say if you want to show that it's your beehive, you would put your symbol on the beehive so people know it's your beehive, right? So if you go through my old exams, you'll see the different ways I can test on it, but I, I can get creative. Okay, cool, thanks. And, and um, I'm going to try to talk about the exam, maybe not today, but maybe the next week or so as we get closer to the to the middle of the semester. This is class, what, seven? We're a third done. I mean, it's, it, the semester flies by so quick. It does. Let's do another question. Uh, go to question number uh, two, please, in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the notes. This is multiple choice as well. This one sounds very easy, and it is. Um, a loses his watch. B finds it. A sues B for recovery of the watch. Who has the stronger claim to the watch? Okay, next up is um, Quinny. I think I heard you're the person. With, yeah, I saw you there before. Okay. Tell me, Andy, what's your answer? Uh, I put A. Okay, tell me why you put A. Um, just because A is the rightful owner of the watch, so therefore he would have a stronger point to it. But B found it. But it's still it's still A's property. Why? Because they're the rightful owner. If this is locked. Who always, Quinny, answer this question, then you'll be done. Who always has the strongest claim in any dispute? The rightful owner. You said the rightful owner. Just what's the rightful owner? I want to make sure I understand what you're saying. Just like the person who it belongs to first, or who like owns it. Okay, excellent. Very good. Thank you so much, Quinny. That's right. So the answer is A. About 90% of you got it right, which is good. 
Now, about 10% of you got it wrong, which is not so good, but I know why you put it, right? You said, well, he found it. True, right? The finder has a stronger claim against subsequent finders, but the original owner, the OG, so to speak, right, has the strongest claim always, right? The original owner always has the strongest claim. The challenge for you is figuring out who the original owner is, right? It's not always clear, right? In this case, I said A loses watch, so you presume A has the watch. But let's say there's a person uh, who dies and he leaves property to two different people, and it's unclear who actually has it, right? The will perhaps is ambiguous, right? Maybe there, there's some ambiguity over who gets it, and then someone takes that chattel. It's often going to be unclear who is there, right? Who is the original owner? All right, any questions on number two? Very good. Most of you got that one right. Yes, Luis, go ahead. Question. So how does this relate to the Peel case? Because we'll get there Peel. later. We'll get there later, okay. my friend. I, I'm trying. Okay. I'm trying to give you really simple to begin with, and Peel's going to just blow that up. Yeah. Okay. That's why I was. I mean, I. I yeah. Okay. Gotcha. I, pr I promise we have to Peel. I promise we will. Only 15 minutes into class. All right. Let's try question number three. Um, I'll put the poll on. All right. And this is going to be for uh, Squinny. It's going to be for Ria in a bit. So here's question number three. F1 owns a watch and loses it. F2 finds it. F3 steals it. Oh, I'm stupid. I'm sorry. I put the wrong thing. This is a short, it's short answer because there's no A and B. This is why you're all confused. I'm sorry. I did the same thing in the other class. F1 owns a watch. Try this again and loses it. F2 finds it. F3 steals it from F2. So here we have a, a dispute. F2 sues F3. Who prevails? And the answer here is either F2 or F3. F2 or F3, who prevails? I did the same thing in the last class. I have to, with the polls, I have to switch between the multiple choice and the short answer, and I forgot to switch it. I'm sorry. All right. Rhea, what's your answer here? Oh, I put F2 would win. Okay. Why is F2 going to win? Well, I think the because the court wants to kind of award noble characters and things like that, and I think stealing is not something the court would want to award. That's what everyone says, but that's not the right that's not the right reasoning. You have the right answer, but not the right reasoning. What's the reason why F two prevails over F three? It's a very simple reason. Nothing to do with honesty and, and morality. I think F two actually found it. I don't think stealing is finding something. Like, oh you know, wow! You're is that is that going to be your position? Well, yeah, because if you feel something, you well, well, Rhea, let me ask you the facts in Armory. Where did little chimney sweep get that jewel? He got it from from the house. Yeah, where do you think he got it from, Rhea? Well, okay, I'm thinking stealing in terms of you're standing there with the jewel, and I come up to you and I take it from your hand. Uh huh. Versus a chimney sweep takes it from the nightstand of the of the mistress of the house, who's not there. That's not stealing. <laughs> Oh my God! Don't don't come to my house if I'm at home. Oh my God! All my stuff is gonna be gone. I have a lot of monitors. You're gonna take them all because I wasn't there. Well, maybe he didn't know that he was stealing it. Oh boy! He knows that he's stealing because it oh. says he steals it. Oh boy! Oh boy! Oh boy! Okay, Ray, you here, Ray? Let's let's try to try. <laughs> Ray, what'd you put here? Ray? Oh, you're in the classroom. I'm sorry. Thank you for the waving. That's actually really helpful. Ray? Uh, so I put F two would prevail as well. Okay, but let me ask you the same question. What's the reason why that F2 prevails? I'm telling you, that's the right answer. So you got the right answer, um, but tell me why. Okay, so when F2 finds it, it's because F1 lost it, which means it wasn't like, I mean, I'm just thinking of, you know, later cases, fields and stuff that make the distinguish between someone who, like, puts something, uh, like, something somewhere on purpose, and then it's like, because they accidentally left it there, and then someone who, uh, you know, puts it in somewhere that they, you know, as for safekeeping and some other people can to uh, take it from. Does it does it matter, Ray, that F three stole it? Does that make any difference for this question? Does it matter that F three stole it from yeah. uh, or you, you stole it from someone who found it? I mean I would say 
yeah, it, it matters because it wasn't like an F2 left it somewhere. All right. One more time. Lindsay, you here? Yeah, I'm here. Lindsay, what, what, what's your rationale here? Would you you put F2, I'm guessing? Yes, I put F2. Okay, tell me, why did you put, put F2? F2? Because, because he had possession before F2. Yes. That's the right answer. In, in, in the dispute between, between two finders, who wins, Linda? The first finder. That's it. Right. All of you gave me a very nice answer, but that's the right answer. When you have a dispute between two finders, the first finder gets it. It has nothing to do with being honest or being a good person or stealing. I want you to remove the concept of theft from your head for this class. Just remove it. I don't want to hear an answer about stealing. Because in this case, Mr. Armory, the chimney sweep, stole the jewel. We all know he stole the jewel. Come on, let's just let's just be can't Rhea smiling. We we all know he stole it from the master of the house. We we know what happened. He didn't just find it in the in the bottom of a chimney. If he did, he stole it. Right. It's, most people who find stuff are stealing it. But in property law, this is not torts or crim. The finder can actually get it. Because think of it like a pyramid, right? Who has the strongest claim? The top of the pyramid, it's the original find, the original owner, right? The master of the house. But then you have Mr. Armory, the chimney sweep, who found it. Found it, right? He stole it. But we don't care that he stole it. All that matters is who has a stronger claim? The chimney sweep or the goldsmith? And as between the chimney sweep and the goldsmith, the chimney sweep has a stronger claim than the goldsmith because he found it first. Because really... The chimney sweep stole it from the master of the house, and the goldsmith's apprentice stole it from the chimney sweep, right? Everyone's stealing from each other. But the chimney sweep has a stronger claim. Melissa, go ahead. So even though uh, there might, like, F1 would have had a stronger claim to it than F2, F2 is still considered a real party in interest. Yes. Yeah. F, if F2 sues F3 and those are the only two parties in the case, then F2 prevails. Right. But what happens, Alyssa, I'll ask you if F1 shows up. Well, what would be the outcome you're asking? I'm asking, yeah. If F1 shows up to court. F1 should, if it's decided correctly, should. Um, That's right. Prevail. Because F1 is the original owner. Correct. He actually purchased the item initially. Okay, very good. Thank you, Alyssa. Let's let's do question number um, four now. I think that's this is basically the question I just gave to Alyssa, so we should all get this one right. Um, F1 owns a watch and loses it. F2 finds it. F3 steals it from F2. Then we see that F1 sues F3. Who wins here? Okay, and this is going to be for, uh, I think, Alexander. Oh, at the bottom of the alphabet. Okay, very good. Back to the top after this. All right, Alexander, help me out, sir. What's your answer here? Oh, you're in the classroom. That's right. I got you. I got you. I got you. Unmute. What's your uh, answer? Here? F1. F1 is the true owner. He owned it before F2, and then F2 owned it before F3. Perfect. So 97% of you got this one right, which is very good. F1 prevails. Why? Because F1 was the original owner. F1 will always beat F3. And I think we already, I think I gave a list of the answers to number five. I'll skip it uh, for, uh, because we already answered it. But if F1 sues F2, F1 will prevail because F1 was the original owner. I want you all to start thinking about property in terms of relationships, right? It's not who owns the uh, the, the watch. It's about who has a strong relationship, right? F2 will beat F3, but F1 will beat F2 and F1 will beat F3, right? The relationships, who has a stronger claim and versus the weaker claim. Here, the weakest claim is F3. The sort of middle claim will be F2 and the strongest claim will be F1. And try and think of it like a pyramid, like a hierarchy, and it'll help you because it's very often in this class where Two people will each lay claim to the same property and they'll each have arguments in their side and you figure out which argument's stronger, right? You found it first, but he had it first as an original owner. Ah, so the original owner gets it. Ah, 
you found it second, so your most recent, but he found it earlier, the earlier finder gets it. And you're gonna need to know which standard applies. Okay, questions so far, guys. All right, I think we're back at the top. Nicholas, I believe, is in the classroom. You there, Nicholas? I'm actually remote today. Oh, you're remote today. Okay, well, you're on my list. Okay, that's fine. All right, I'll call on you in a minute. Let's do question number six, uh, multiple choice. And I'll uh, call on Nicholas just in a minute for this one. Okay. Armory adopted the rule of finders, keepers, true or false? Okay, another five seconds. All right, Nicholas, help us out here. What's your answer? I put false because it says that it's not, it's everybody but the owner. So that's like oh, like it's kind of both in a way. I mean, finders keepers unless the owner comes knocking on your door saying, "I want the thing back." So when you were a kid on the playground, right, and someone said finders keepers, how did you understand that to mean? I mean, it felt pretty absolute. <laughs> <laughs> right, whoever found it got the keep. Is that what you're saying? There you go. Okay, so whoever found it got the keep it, right? Yeah. Is that the rule that was established in Armory? Uh, I mean... The way I read it, yeah, unless the owner wanted it. Oh, but 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 the, that last part Did, was that was that part of the playground rule that if the original owner shows up, he gets it back. Not on my playground. Not on your playground. Okay, I think you're on the same playground I was on. Uh, I I'm gonna say this one's false, right? The rule that we all learn, finders keeper, is whoever finds it keeps it, right? So if you lose something, that's too bad. You shouldn't have lost it. That that's how I learned it. Maybe maybe you had different playgrounds, right? But the rule that was put forward in Armory was different, right? The rule is the finder does not acquire an absolute property interest, right? But the finder has a superior interest against everyone but the rightful owner. This is our F1, right? The finder has a superior interest against everyone but the rightful owner. Okay. That's the holding in armory. One second, Grace, I got you in a second, right? And this is how you have to think of the relationships. You have the original owner, then you have the gold, the chimney sweep, and then at the bottom of the pyramid, you have the goldsmith. Right, the goldsmith's claim falls below that of the chimney sweep, and the chimney sweep falls below that of the original owner that he stole it from. Grayson, go ahead. Um, no, I just put true for the finder's keeper. It seemed like the sweep was the finder. But the rule is that does a finder always get to keep it? Not always, but in this instance. In this instance, yeah. Thank you. Um, the rule, again, this is why I, I encourage people, don't say finders, keepers. I think it sends the, the wrong sort of message about how these rules go. Uh, Lacey, go ahead. I was just wondering, in this case, if the original owner found out about this trover that came, you know, this, whatever, this case came up, and the original owner's like, well, that's, those are my jewels. So who would they go to? Oh, would such they a go good to question. the goldsmith who still has the jewels, or would they go to the chimney sweep who was paid the money? Oh, that's jewels? such a good question. At least, I, let me ask you a follow up question. I maybe I'll hopefully answer yours. Uh, this was a case for the King's Bench, which is like the highest court in England, right? It's it's called King's Bench because it's a King's Court, right? And sometimes it's Queen's Bench when they're queens. This is the King's Court. How is it that this little chimney sweep is able to litigate a case all the way to the King's Bench? How is this even possible? I have no idea. Me I neither. I think, sure. but this, I don't know how it happens. But, and the second question I want to ask you is where was the person he stole this from? 
Right. I mean, I think we can all agree he stole this, right? I think, Lacey, you're, you're with me on that one? He stole it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. I think everyone's nodding. Okay. He stole it. How come the original property owner hasn't showed up and said, hey, uh, uh, chim chim cheri, give me my, 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 my thing back, right? Right. Right. So I think to answer your question, this is probably something of a setup where the family knew that this jewel was stolen, but they felt bad for the boy. Now, your actual question is, could the who would the family have showed up to, right? Could the family sue the jeweler? Could the family sue the boy? All right. So there are two ways of looking at it. They can choose. They can have one bite the apple. They can either or. They can't get both, right? In other words. The family can't ask the money for the boy, uh, can't ask the boy for the money, and ask the jewelry, uh, the goldsmith, to get back the jewel. They can't do both. They can pick one. Because um, if they ask the uh, – because think of it this way. If the goldsmith pays the boy, he has, he has nothing, right? He paid out the value of the jewel. So he can't be hit twice for both the original owner and the boy. So the way it would probably work is – the boy sues the goldsmith, and the family sues the boy. Or the family could just sue the goldsmith to return the jewel. What's called detinue. You could do either way. But then if the family sues the goldsmith to return the jewel, and the goldsmith has already paid the chimney sweep for the price of the jewel, then the goldsmith... Well, you can't do that. Pay. Right. So in that case, you'd have to go after the boy. Okay. Okay. That was, I was wondering yeah. like how that It's works. messy. It's messy. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Alexander, go ahead. Oh, you're on the classroom. Yes, I know. Thank you. There you go. Uh, what would be stopping if we're assuming that the family helps the boy litigate this? What would be stopping the family from, you know, avoiding the litigation saying, going after the shop owner and then just giving the money to the boys again? That's one of my theories, what was actually happening, that the family was actually running this litigation, and they thought it'd be better to have the boy as a litigant than, the, than this wealthy family. That was actually one of my theories, but I, I, I'm not sure. Um, but for all we know, look, maybe the family was paying for the boy's attorneys to litigate this case, but the understanding that they would get the money back from the boy. Maybe that was the understanding. Maybe they, maybe they give the boy a cut. I don't know. Maybe, you know, there's a really wealthy family who they, they thought it'd be embarrassing for them to go into court to sue over this stupid jewel, right? Um, so I think that, that that might be what was going on. I, I, I don't, I don't know for certain. Um, but I mean, it, it is crazy that, you know, this little, I mean, chimney sweep, this is in the, this is in the book. This was a very dangerous profession, right? The reason why they use little boys, uh, for the job was that they could fit in these very, you know, narrow chimneys. And what they would basically do is they would shimmy up these pipes with these little brushes to try and knock out all the soot. Um, and very often they would get stuck. Right. Imagine if you're shimming and your knees stuck underneath your body and you can't get out. They would often be tugged from underneath, but if they couldn't get out, they'd die. They would asphyxiate. They'd suffocate. It's awful. It was, it was just, just an awful way to die as a young boy, five, four or five years old. Um, you know, I can't even think about this. Um, it's awful. Uh, so this little boy probably stole the jewel and he got caught up in this entire affair. Okay. All right. I think we've done the bulk of the, the Brandenburg case. I'm not Brandenburg. Um, uh, Armory, sorry. Wrong, wrong things on my mind today. Uh, let me just give you the rule that, that's usually stated as, right? Let me just write this down. Um, the title of the finder is good as against the whole world, but the true owner. Again. The title of the finder is good as against the whole world, but the true owner. Okay. And this is a simple rule from Armory. Um, unfortunately, the cases get more complicated after Armory, but this is the rule from Armory. Uh, the other two parts of Armory I'm not so concerned about. The first is what you might call a respondeat superior theory, where the um, the agent, uh, actually the apprentice, took the jewel, but the goldsmith is liable. That that's pretty easy. And the third one is kind of funny. How do you calculate damages in this case? Well, the court says we're just going to assume it's the most valuable jewel possible that could fit in this socket, that could fit in this, um, you know, the in the setting. 
So the most valuable ice there is, right? The most, the most cleanest jewel, that's what it is. That's how they measure the damages. All right, any questions on Armory? Very good case. I like this case. It's short, but it's good. Yeah, Alyssa, go ahead. Okay, so uh, for the life of me, I cannot remember the name of the case, but I think we talked about it in our contracts class this semester, and it was about an owner of this expensive painting, um, and the painting had been stolen from her, and then it was sold at a gallery and someone bought it. And this was, I want to say, like 20 years. I, I don't know. She's been looking at, for it for a really long time. Anyway, the court ended up holding. O'Keefe? Is this O'Keefe o- Snyder? He worked the balding chair. Okay. So, I, I don't know. But anyway, the court ended up ruling for the, the, the one who bought it from the gallery, even though it was stolen. So it's like, I don't understand. How can you help me reconcile how? I don't know that case. If you want to maybe, uh, I don't know the case. I'm sorry. Uh, DeWorth versus Bollinger, I've never heard that case before. So I can maybe look at it later, but but I just, I don't know. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, believe it or not, professors don't talk to each other about what they teach. I, I maybe I'll call, who do you have for contracts? Carlson. Uh, maybe I'll call Professor Carlson later, but I, I'm not familiar with that case. I'm sorry. Uh, Wait, someone's telling me we didn't talk about it in contracts. I don't know where I'm very confused. Um, I guess it was Sid Pro, so maybe Field. Well, you're very negative. Okay, well, is, if you want to maybe talk about maybe office hours, I can, but I don't want to spend too much time on it, so I'm, I'm not <laughs> sure. I, I did the best we can. Thank you, though. Yeah, I, 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 it's hard enough doing my own cases. I can't know all the other cases, but uh, I, I do appreciate it. Um, okay, let's do some, let's move on. Uh, all right, so that's the rule in Armory. Armory is a nice, easy rule. But then we get to our next case, which is a little more complicated. And I want to just define some terminology first. So uh, I'll put these into the class notes. Um, and the term I want to define is called a bailment. Bailment, oh, that's just way too small. Make a bigger font. Okay, a bailment. Okay. What is a bailment? A bailment is when you entrust someone else with your property. And I'll give you a very easy example. Uh, valley parking, right? When you go to a restaurant and you give them your keys, um, you presume that um, they're going to hold on to your keys and like not destroy your car, right? They'll have some duty of care to manage your car correctly. Oh, could someone in the classroom, the, the camera has, has tilted or I'm looking at your feet. It's very strange. It's just, just go over and lift it up, please. Thank you. Yeah, it, it's, it's been slowly drooping down the entire class. Oh, that, that's great. Okay, that's good. Thank you so much, whoever just did that. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, a bailment is when you entrust them with your property. So you go to valet parking, you give them your keys. They're not going to destroy your car. Uh, dry cleaning, right? If you bring your clothes to the dry cleaner, you presume they're not going to, you know, destroy your clothes. They're going to keep it in some sort of good condition. Very often when you think about lost property, you think about it in terms of a bailment, right? Why? Um, If I drop my wallet on a counter in a restaurant, like let's say I'm paying my bill and I drop my wallet on a counter, Right. I would assume, I hope that the owner of the restaurant, the manager would keep my wallet there and safekeeping for me to come back and get it later. Right. It's basically a bailment. But let's say I go and visit some city for, you know, for an hour, I'm sorry, for a weekend. And um, is it, does it keep drooping down? Is that what's going on? Don't worry about it. Just, just go back and sit down and pay attention to class. Yeah. It's just, it's fine. I'll, I'll ask IT about it later. Right. So let's say I go visit Dallas for a weekend. And at some point in this weekend, I lose my credit card. I don't know where I put it. Um, 
I have no idea where it is, right? So it's harder to say you want to recover property when it's not clear where you left it, right? So keep that in mind. Bailment is when you leave it with someone for their trusting. Now, two terms I need you to know, bailor and bailee. Okay, bailor and bailee. Pay attention to the last two letters, bailor and bailee. Bailor is a person who gives a bailment, right? Who gives an item for safekeeping. And bailee is a person who receives a bailment, right? Who receives an item for safekeeping, right? If I leave my items on the counter of a restaurant somewhere, my, my credit card, for example, my wallet, um, I've given a bailment basically, right? And the store is the bailee. They've received that bailment. Now, how do you remember the difference between a bailor and a bailee? Focus on the last two letters. When you see a word that ends with E-E, -E, it's the person receiving something. Um, how do I remember that? Think of like me, give it to me, M-E-E, -E, right? When you see E-E, -E, it's who's receiving it. When you see O-R, it's giving it, giving the bailment. So for example, grantor, grantee, um, transferor, transferee, mortgagor, mortgagee. We'll see this throughout the semester in different contexts. So just keep in mind the O-R and the E. Okay. All right, questions. All right, very good. Uh, I think Dana, you're next. Yes. Yeah, Dana. All right, thank you. Um, could you please give me the facts in Hannah versus Peel? I sure can. Thank you. Um, so in this case, there is a man, Peel, who owns this house, and he doesn't really live there. He just kind of ha owns this house and this land. And um, the defendant is one of, or sorry, the plaintiff is one of the soldiers that quarters there from time to time. Right. And um, and one time whenever he was quartering there, he I guess he was looking around the room and he put his hand up on this windowsill ledge and found this brooch and it was like a nice one. He kept it. Wait, wait, what's a brooch? Just so everyone knows what a brooch is. Um, I'm pretty sure it's like a little pin that you can wear. Like, yeah, it's like pretty jewelry. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And, um, I guess at first he tried to give, well, I think he handed it to the police first to discuss it with them mm -hmm. to see if he should keep it or if he can, or if he should return it. But, um, the defendant, the owner of the house, later offered a reward for it, but the plaintiff decided that if you don't know if it belongs to you or not, then I can probably keep it. Okay, very good. Thank you so much. All right, excellent. Thank you. Um, so this is a, a, a very simple case. Peel never actually went to the house. He was never there. Uh, we're in the middle of World War II. The British military requisitions, which is a fancy word for seizes, right? When the government says, we need your house for the military. And he's like, okay, whatever. Um, troops are stationed there. And Mr. Hanna is taking his hand on the top of a windowsill, and he finds a little piece of jewelry. Now, you may think, of, okay, whatever, a brooch. This brooch was worth 66 pounds, which is about $4,000. So this is a non-trivial amount of money, right? This is a, you know, $4,000 piece of jewelry. That's a lot of cash. He brings it home. He holds on to it for about two months. Hmm. He got a little bit guilty, maybe. He felt a little bit, you know, maybe I shouldn't keep it, right? He had second thoughts. So he brought it to his commanding officer. The commanding officer said, give it to the police, Right. Why? Well, the presumption is if you give it to the police and the true owner shows up, then the owner will go to the police and say, hey, I have lost my jewelry. Police hold on to it for a couple of years. No one shows up. And they say, okay, fine. We're going to give it to the owner of the house. 
Now, Mr. Hanna doesn't like that furniture. Like, Why are you giving the owner of the house? It's 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 mine. I found it. Peel sells it to a jeweler. And then Hannah sues Peel. All right. What makes this case so difficult is that there's not a single precedent to govern it. It's a case within a case. Um, there are four cases discussed here, my friends. You need to know all four of them. I'm sorry. And all four of these cases are not in perfect synchrony, right? They don't line up neatly. All right. Um, so, Nazreen, you here? Yes, I'm here. Okay, thank you, Nazreen. So let's talk about the first case that's discussed, which is one we just did, uh, Armory versus Delamory. Under their own Armory, who wins here? Um, Hannah. Okay, Hannah wins. Why do you say Hannah wins? Because, um, or I'm sorry, not Hannah. Peel, because of the original owner, so... Was Peel the original owner of the of the brooch? I'm I'm probably getting them mixed up. Do we know um, who the original no, owner of the brooch is? The original owner of the house. So, okay. Um, because the brooch was in his house, and we found out about it after the fact. Under Armory, he would probably win. Okay. So, one more time. What was real Armory? An armory was that finder keepers, unless the true owner. Okay. Shows up. So who is the finder here? The finder was Hannah. Okay. So who wins the armory? Just to be clear. You Peele. said. Well, because Peel owns the house. That's so not the rule in armory. Owner. What's the rule in armory? Finders keepers, unless the original owner. Um, Ask for it back. Who is the owner of the brooch? Do we know? Well, I'm just assuming Peel. No, that's not correct. That's not an assumption. That the facts say it's not. He was not the owner of the brooch. Did, did Peel even know about the brooch's existence? No, not until after the fact. So how could he be the owner? Okay, so Hannah's the owner. Okay, one more time. What was the rule in Armory? Finders keepers until the original owner shows up. Okay. Do we know the original owner here? No. Good. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. We got that straight. Okay. Good. Under Armory, Hannah wins here, right? Hannah prevails because he was the first finder. The rule in Armory didn't consider where the property is found. That's why I was giving Nazreen a bit of a hard time. She kept saying, well, Peel owns the house. That's true. 100% true. Peel owns the house. But that wasn't relevant for Armory. Okay, so Hannah's like, Armory, I win. But that's not the only case. Um, Elizabeth, are you here? I think you're in the classroom. Uh, I'm online. Okay, you're online today. Okay, I have my list of who's in the classroom. People are moving, but that's fine. Um. Uh, what was the next case the court discussed? Uh, Bridges. Okay. Or um, South Stanford Shore. Okay, yeah. No, 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 Bridges. Yeah, so give me the facts in Bridges. Um, so here... So here the issue was whether the notes that were found. So a customer of a shop dropped some notes, um, not, not like through their purpose, but just accidentally. The notes were found. Um, the finder gave them to the owner of the shop. Then um, whenever the owner of the shop couldn't find the actual owner or the person that dropped the notes, um, they wanted to keep them. The finder wanted the notes back. Okay, very good. All right, so someone dropped money in a shop. Bridges found it. Bridges gave it to the owner. Does the original 
person who had the money ever show up? No. We have no idea where he is. So in a dispute between the finder and the owner of the shop, who prevails here? The finder. Okay. Does it matter the money was found in the store? No. Okay. Um, later on in the notes, they consider um, where the property was found, but they say that it, uh, it was dropped in like a public place. So it wasn't um, of the possession or under the right of the owner. Okay. Very good. Very good. Thank you. The Armory case didn't consider where the location where it was found. Bridges also did not consider where the item was found. All that mattered was that the first person who finds it gets it. But the next case screws things up a bit, right? And that's probably where your notes start taking a detour to oh my God, right? The next case is called South Staffordshire Water Company versus Charmin, right? Versus Charmin. Okay, we'll get to the facts of that case in a minute. But the judge in the Charmin case either misread or didn't understand Bridges, right? The judge in Charmin said, aha, the rule in Bridges is that the owner of the property has a claim to the item, right? Where generally the rule is finder's keeper. But in some cases, you give the property to the person, I'm sorry, you give the money to the person who owns the property. I said again, generally the rule in armory is finders. The first finder gets it. But in some cases where the property, so where the money is found on property, you give it to the property owner. That was not the rule in armory. That was not the rule in bridges. But the Charmin court sort of tweaked or modified that rule. Okay. Everyone with me? Any questions so far? All right. So then we get to the third case. Uh, who's next? Um, Andrew, you here? Yes, I am. Can you give me the facts, please, in um, uh, Charmin? Sure. So an employee, the defendant is an employee, I believe, of the water company. Uh, and he's filling, he's cleaning out a pool on, um, I guess, the customer's land and finds two uh, rings, I believe, at the bottom of the mud, stuck uh, or stuck in the mud at the bottom. Um, he comes up. He, he doesn't get it to his employee. He doesn't try to find the rightful owner. And then I believe he just, uh, uh, I think he just, I feel like he just, uh, just hold on to him essentially. Uh, okay. The, so the, just where were the rings found? So they were found and embedded in the mud at the bottom of this pool. Okay. So, so, so the, 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 the rings were in the pool. I mean, we can imagine how do you think the rings got there? Just, just take a guess. I'm sure someone was swimming or something and they fell off their hands. Yeah. Or... Yeah. Someone was in the water, right? Someone was cleaning it. It fell out of their fingers. It happens all the time, right? People drop their rings on their sinks all the time. It happens, right? It wasn't a case where like, you know, a person, you know, deliberately put his ring in the bottom of the pool, right? He just was, it fell off his finger, right? Right. Um, we have the finder and we have the person who owns the pool. Who wins here? Uh, uh, I think the the person who owns the pool is what the court says. Under the rule in Armory and, and Hawksworth, who would win here? Uh, the um, the person who finds it, because we don't know who the one yeah. or the original owner. Yeah, the person who finds it. But who's the court rule for here? I, I'm pretty sure they 
rule for the for the owner of the the pool. Exactly. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Andrew. So we have here um, a shift in the law where the court sort of puts forward this new rule where um, if you find property that's buried in the ground, it belongs to the owner of the property, right? There's this phrase here. I'll, I'll type in the chat so you have it. It's a, I know you guys love Latin. Uh, locus in quo. Locus in quo. All right, what does that mean? The person owns the property, right? If you find something and they say it's attached to the land, that's the way the, the phrase is attached to the land, it belongs to the loaner of the locus in quo, the property owner. It didn't matter that Mr. Um, uh, Sharman found it. That's irrelevant. What matters is who owns the land. <sighs> okay, so if it's attached to the land, the owner keeps it. It doesn't matter who finds it. That's the rule the court puts here. Yes, yeah, so Janet, go ahead. Does it matter that word that you said, like it's attached to the land, as opposed to like if, it, if you can just remove it? Because I mean, rings could were removed. Well, when they say attached, let's just let's just think of that for a second, Janet. That doesn't mean like you know it was like it was like chained there. It means it was part of the soil. It means buried. You know what would have you know was a was a piece of jewelry on a windowsill attached to the house? No. Um, yeah, no, it was in there. No, no. Yeah. Yeah. All right, all right. Thank you, Jeanette. All right, so that's the rule in Charmin. One more case. Uh, who's next uh, after Andrew? Is uh, give me a second. Uh, David. Yes, it's the uh, Elvis or Ools versus Bird Gas Company. Yeah, you want to give the facts here, please? Yeah. So um, they gave the owner gave. Uh, a lease to the a 99 year lease to the gas company to extract Good. minerals from their land. Good. And then uh, they, while they're installing a uh, whatever it was to hold uh, the gas gas holder. Right. Down like a prehistoric. A, a gas holder, just so you know, is like a it's an underground container where you put gas in, just like a storage area. All right, go on. They found a uh, prehistoric boat. Huh? How did how did it get there? And I guess it crashed and. No, got covered by soil. Is there any way we could discover the the rightful heir of the two thousand year old boat? Probably not. Absolutely not. Yeah, not probably. Absolutely no. No way. No way. Right. The heirs are long gone. We have no idea who these people are. All right. Thanks so much for that, uh, David. Um, so they find this two thousand year old boat, which apparently is quite valuable. They put it in this way in a museum. You know, so they charge admission prices. Right. So it was a big deal. Um, now who gets it? The gas company that discovered it or the person who had the right to the soil right again the gas company could extract minerals a boat is not a mineral so they, you know that that doesesn't help them who wins here uh Alyssa? um well the judge said that he thinks that the plaintiff um has the actual right to because he describes it as a chattel instead of a part of the soil so why does the why does the mineral I'm sorry why does why does the finder not win here why does the property owner win? Um, one of the reasons was because the original owner couldn't be established, um, and even though even though the plaintiff wasn't aware of the boat being on his property, um, I think they said that the gas company only had rights to the minerals in the land, not actually the land itself. Okay, let me ask the question a little bit differently, uh, Alyssa. Um, why, which rule is a court applying here? Which precedent do you think informs a court's opinion? Which uh, of, the, of the precedents we've discussed so far, which one do you think is most relevant? He 
the Charmin one. Charmin. And what was the rule in Charmin? The possessor of the land is generally entitled as against the finder to chattels found on the land. Okay. Right. So again, thank you. Thank you, Alyssa. So again, we have this general rule that the finder gets it, but the rule has been modified such that if the land, I'm sorry, such that if the item is attached to the land, like the boat buried in the soil, it belongs to the owner of the soil, right? It's as if the boat itself is part of the soil and the, the owner of the land gets it. So you can't even discover it because it's part of the soil. It's not yours to find in the first place. You know what? I said discover. I shouldn't have said that because that's a discovery doctrine. You find it, right? So I made the mistake. I told you not to make it. So easy it is to make. So don't say discover. Say find. All right? Everyone with me? So we have these four cases. We have armory, which is basically first finder wins. Then we have bridges, which is the person who finds the money in the store wins. But then we have Charmin, which says the finder wins unless it's attached to the ground. Then we have Elves versus Brig Gas, which is, again, the finder wins unless it's attached to the ground. So these four cases that don't line up very neatly. And then we come to this case, right? The, the case involving Hannah and Peel. So that was Alyssa. Uh, Javon, you there? I think you're in the classroom, right? Yeah. I can put you on mute. Javon, so what does the court actually do here? Has the court actually resolved this dispute? Um, well, they, they ruled for the plaintiff. They, they basically said that uh, the, the defendant was never physically in possession of the premises, and so he was never physically in possession of the, uh, the brooch either. So they, they made it um, clear, and clearly that the brooch had been there for a long time, so he, and he also wasn't the, they know he wasn't the true owner either. So they gave it to the plaintiff because he found it. Did the, so the court, Javon, just to be clear, the Bridges case, right? Yeah, I believe so. Did they not find the the um, the Charmin or the, the Brig Gas case relevant to this one? I want to say that the reason that they they said that um, those weren't, those didn't apply because he, he was never on the premises. Mm. Okay. All right. All right. Good. Thanks, Yvonne. Uh, Joseph, you here? Joseph? No. Adalas, you here? You're in the classroom, right? Yeah. Hi. Um, Adalas, let me ask you this question, please. Does this sound like a stupid rule? where if it's in the soil, it belongs to the owner, but if it's on top of the soil, it belongs to the finder. It doesn't sound like a really dumb rule. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes, okay. Tell me why it sounds like a dumb rule. Well, okay, so what if, I mean, what if uh, the brooch was halfway, let's just say it was actually on the floor instead of on like a bookshelf or something. What if the, bo the brooch was halfway poking out of the ground but halfway in the ground? I mean, so, so Dallas, let me ask this question, right? How do you think, or, or let, let me ask a question. This is a good way, a good bridge to the next case. What's the difference between lost and mislaid property? Maybe that might help answer this question I just gave you. Okay. Uh, so like in the, the next case, the McAvoy case, I think a uh, person who went to the store just kind of forgot uh, some of their property on a table. And we don't really know what happened with this brooch. Like, did someone hide it? Did someone leave it? Was it on purpose? Good. So. Good. So, all right, thanks, Adela. So, I think I think she's getting closer to the answer I want to get at. Right? Why do you have this stupid rule where if it's sort of on the floor, it's one rule, but if it's buried in the ground, it's another? Um, this has happened to me. I'm sure it's happened to you. How many of you have ever went to go pay for something and you left your credit card at the counter? Right. It's happened to me, right? A couple of years ago, I was at the airport and I was buying dinner. I swiped my credit card to pay for dinner. And then they got distracted, looked at my phone or something, you know, and I was waiting for my receipt. I put the, put the card down and I just walked away. And then somehow magically, my credit card wound up buying stuff at Walmart that evening. I don't know how it happened, right? Just, just you know, the, the magic. 
Uh, but I knew it's like, oh, wait a minute, I paid for dinner at that restaurant. Let me call them and get, you know, my credit card back. And it turns out that whoever was working there stole it and just used it. And at first thing up, you know, in trouble, but uh, that's what happened. Okay. Now, have you ever, you know, visited some city on vacation and you lost an item on your trip and you have no idea where it is, right? You know, you had it when you left town and when you got back, you didn't have it. You don't even know where to look, right? You have no idea where to look. The law draws a distinction between mislaid property as you put your credit card on the counter and you forgot it was there because you know where to get it, right? You left your credit card on the counter versus, oh, crap, I lost in the ocean somewhere, right? I, le I left it in the water. I have no idea where it even is. Uh, uh, um, you know, I, I have no idea where, 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 the, uh, where the item is. It's in the bottom of a pool somewhere. Um, so it makes some sense the law draws a distinction between property that's sort of just mislaid and property that's lost, whether it, you know, it's on the floor or something. But this idea of if it's buried in the ground seems just so, I don't know, just it's never made a lot of sense to me. Because when it's in the ground, no one knows it's there. It's probably been there for a very long time. Why shouldn't the finder get it? But I don't know. Alexander, go ahead. I see your hands up. And I see you're in the classroom, so I unmute you. Go ahead. Uh, this felt like it was kind of modeling the difference between personal property and private property. Uh, right, if a, if a channel is unmovable and keeps it on you, and the doctrine of acquisition might find it applies to lost channels, the fact that they're saying, like, well, it's embedded in the land, so it's kind of like, you know, the public is trying to make it seem like it's private property. Yeah, I, I don't know what you mean by private property. Maybe maybe tell me what you mean by that term. It's a, it's a, it's a term I'm not familiar with, how you're using it. Oh, sorry. Uh, I mean, land that's Oh, you're saying that the, that the chattel becomes part of the land? Is that what you're saying? I mean, when they're saying that it's like it's uh, embedded in the soil, maybe it seems like they're trying to say that because the person owns the soil. Yeah. The the so soil. it's the same way as if you find oil or gas or gold under your land, it's yours, kind of like that? Right. Uh, but that's also mineral rights. It, it's, I almost tricked you there. Yeah. But exactly right. So the courts are just mishing up a couple different doctrines, but you see what they're doing here, right? They're, I think what, 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 what Alexander is saying is they're treating the uh, boat under the ground as if it was like a mineral or something that was there, which belongs to the owner of the property, um, which is generally with the rule of capture. Uh, if you own the, the surface rights, you have the subsurface rights and you can get there first. Okay. But don't, confuse rule of capture with the um, fine doctrine. I know that's what you want to do, but a boat is not oil because it's not from nature. It's a it's a chattel. It's something that's man-made. A ring is man-made. A brooch is man-made. Okay? All right. Thank you, Alexander. All right. So the holding, my friends, in um, uh, uh, what do you call it? In um, Hannah can be described in two ways. And this, this is what the court says. He has two general principles. First, a man possesses everything that is unattached to his land. A man possesses everything which is... Uh, I said it wrong. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. A man possesses everything that is attached to his land. A man possesses everything that is attached to his land. Attached. That's the word, attached. Second, a man does not necessarily possess a thing which is unattached to the land. Again, a man does not necessarily possess a thing which is unattached to the land. So we have this very strange distinction where the ring in the bottom of the pool belongs to the property owner, but the jewelry on top of the windowsill belongs to the finder. That doesn't make a terrible lot of sense, but that's the rule that we have. Yes, yeah, so, so go ahead. Um, that rule is only assuming, though, that uh, that thing that's unattached to the land doesn't belong to the landowner. Like, let's say, for example, the brooch had belonged to um, the owner of the house. Well, the original that owner, well, this I think this is what Nezreen got tripped up on a few minutes ago. We have to distinguish the owner of the house versus the owner of the brooch. They're not the same thing. In this case, Peel bought the house recently. He had no idea this brooch even existed. Right. Well, I mean, so I'm talking about in the case where, like, 
he does own the house and he also owns the shadow. Oh, if he owns both, then he's a superior claim, right? If you're the OG, you own the jewel, it's yours, right? You have the strongest claim. But in this case, he had bought the house recently. He didn't even know the brooch existed. It probably been up, you know, in this windowsill for decades under under cobwebs and you know d dirt. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. All right, uh, Javon, go ahead. I see your hands up, and I'll unmute the classroom. Um, the part, I guess, the part that kind of confuses me a little bit is that it kind of makes it seem like if someone comes on, like into my, like, someone comes into my house, and there's like a child that you know, I didn't know was there, and if they found it there, it's theirs. You know? Well, he was allowed to be in the house, so just keep in mind this wasn't a trespasser, right? I think that'd be a different yeah, story. I mean, but even like, even though, like, even if they are there, like on purpose or whatever, <clears throat> say like I bought a house, and there was like a secret stash that was from the owners from a hundred years ago. You know, you came to my house and you found it, like, oh, well, it's mine now. That isn't necessarily seen. Okay, That's so the, the, there is there is another doctrine where. Um, if if you knowingly possess something for many years, you're basically a squatter you can acquire. That's called adverse possession. We'll do that next semester. But the general rule is the original owner can always come back and claim it unless you have some other reason why not to. It may, may seem unfair. I recently had my uh, patio redone, and we had this idea, which we didn't end up doing. We wanted to actually put these plastic skeletons underneath the, underneath the patio. So whoever rips it up in the future will find these skeletons. We we thought about it. We just never got around. We never got our act together. We thought it would be funny. You know, we'll play a prank at somewhere in the future. <laughs> and we were put like a little dog skeleton too. Just <laughs> like I want to put a mom, a dad, and a dog, and a kid, like an entire family just under the patio. <laughs> I didn't do it. Uh, Alyssa, go ahead. <laughs> So just to follow up, uh, let's say, for example, well, you said there's two rules. Uh, one is a man possesses everything that is attached to his land. Um, what if that boat, um, what if we could trace the original ownership of that boat? Good. What then you should. That, huh? You should. Yeah, if you can trace the original ownership, th th then that person can come back. But we're talking thousands of years. There's, right. there's no that, real that way rule, of doing that. That rule is subject to the exception that even something attached to somebody's land, if you can trace it back to its original owner, the original owner would have the strongest claim to it. Right? Correct. Yeah. But after 2000 years, I don't think we're going to get there. Right. Okay. Cool. All right, Catherine, just hang tight. I want to do the last case, but I promise I'll call on you in a minute. Um, the last case, which is actually very simple. It's very short. is from Massachusetts. And it puts out a different rule that when you leave money on a table, it's not actually lost property. Huh? When you leave money on a table, it's not lost. You mislaid it. And this, I think Jeanette had this question a few minutes ago. The difference between lost and, no, no, it was, it was a dollar, yeah. It was different between uh, a lost and mislaid property, right? Lost and mislaid. I think Jeanette had that question in my first class. This is, this is, uh, uh, no, no, Jeanette's here. Jeanette's here. I, I, it's, it's so trippy when you do the same class back to back. I forget which is which, right? Lost and mislaid property. Mislay property is when you put it on the table and you forget it's there. Lost property is when it falls out of your pocket onto the floor. And this, this distinction actually makes some sense to me, right? If it's on the table versus the floor, you don't drop something on the table. You put it on the table and forget it's there. But you don't put something on the floor. It falls out of your pocket or you drop it or you know it slips out of your fingers. And what the court says is when it's on a table, it's not lost property. Therefore... The fine doctrine does not apply. Instead, it's a bailment. The owner of the shop has a reasonable duty of care. The owner of the shop has a reasonable duty of care to, to, to keep track of the item and to ensure it's not, not, not abused and destroyed. Right? So in the McElvey versus Medina case, the guy lost money in a barber shop. The f guy found it. Too bad. It's not his. It belongs to the shop owner. And if you go to the class notes, I've done my best to summarize. I'm going to go about a minute over. I apologize. If you have to go, that's that's fine. So if you go to the class notes, I've, I've done a very brief summary that I think brings all these cases together. All right. If there's a lost item that's attached to the ground, that's buried in the soil, it goes to the property owner. 
And this is Charmin and Briggs. Now what happens if the item is unattached to the ground? Well, we ask, is it lost or misplaced? If it's on the floor, that's some evidence that the item was lost. And then under the Bridges case, it goes to the finder. What if the item is misplaced? For example, is misplaced on a table. In that case, McAvoy is the relevant rule and it goes to the property owner, the barbershop owner or the shopkeeper, right? So when you have one of these fine questions, you have to sort of walk through each of these different layers, right? Was it attached? Was it misplaced? Was it lost, right? And each rule has a different case and you'll need to know which case governs each rule. It's not enough to know the rule, you have to know the cases as well. And finally, please don't apply these to wild animals. If it's a wild animal, give me a Pearson V post, right? Give me Genby Rich. Don't give me Charmin and McAvoy and, and, and uh, Armory, okay? Okay, I'm out of time. I'll start the minute poll now. Please fill it in when you can. Catherine and then Alyssa. I was just curious if in that last case, the Hannah case, if, if the defendant uh, could argue that the brooch was somehow a decorative piece attached to the window treatment. Uh, it's still technically attached to the <laughs> house, attached to the land, so they would have an argument if they could, correct? Yeah, someone always raises us that it was covered in dirt, so it became part of the house. Um, I don't know what attached even means. It's not defined, but I think attached generally means in the soil, underground, not on top of a surface. But, but good, good thought. Alyssa, go ahead. Uh, what if it's impossible to tell whether it was lost or mislaid? Like you'd have to know, you'd have to know the original owner's intent. Yeah, it's it's a very hard question. If it's on the table, it's pretty clearly mislaid. If it's on the floor, it's not. What if it's I mean, you know? What if it's on a chair? Right? It could have fallen out of your pocket, or maybe you put it there. Right? Very often, when I sit down, my phone falls out of the pocket into the chair. Right. So, or like, what if it's in a you know? A car, right? You, you leave your phone in the glove compartment of a rental car. You know, it, there's there's some harder cases. So, so how would that be? I mean, uh, I don't know. These, these, this is why you have lawyers, right? You'd have to you'd have to argue which is which, and you know, like in the Barry Bonds case, very often it's not clear how to describe the these disputes, and you have so to, you gotta, be up to the fact finder. You got to make the decision. Yeah, there's there's not always. I mean, there's not always going to be a clear answer to any question, unfortunately. Uh, yes, Jeanette, go ahead. Well, the rule for finding doesn't apply to mislaid property, right? Well, if it's mislaid, it's not lost. So really, it applies what, to the lost right, items. Correct. When you have it mislaid, it's more of a bailment. That's how you just sort of think about it. The finder doesn't get it at all. Yeah. I, is that because you assume that the owner like still knows? Yes, and he's going to come back and try and retrieve it from the shopkeeper because it's a bailment. He, it's like if I leave my clothes to the dry cleaners, oh, I'll go back to the dry cleaners to get my, you know, imagine this is true. Right, I always keep a pocket constitution in my suit jackets, and I always bring them to the dry cleaners, and I forget the constitutions in there, and they think, "Oh, you forgot your constitution." I'm like, thank you. Right, they held on to my constitution for me when I brought the clothes there. It's that sort of idea. They always think it's a passport. It's very funny. It's like, "Oh, you left your passport." No, it's a constitution. All right. So once we determine an item's lost, then we can ask ourselves, was it attached or not attached, and then apply the rules. Yep. 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 That's it. Okay. Cool. Thank. Thank you, Jeanette. Thanks. Anything else? All right, I'll have office hours as usual around 2.45. Uh, I will see you all soon. Thank you so much. Have a great day.